Imagine yourself at the age of 75. What do you hope to be doing? Is it golfing? Playing with your grandchildren? Or perhaps traveling the world? There are many positive aspects of aging and the lifestyle that retirement may offer. There are some negatives as well. For some of us, wrinkles might be the least of our worries. We may not move as fast. We may not see and hear as well. We may forget where we place our cell phone or our car keys. My husband can tell you that's already a daily challenge for me. <laughs> we are all aging. These positive and negative aspects make each of our aging experiences unique. For me, my grandparents are my inspiration. Their aging experiences couldn't be more different. My grandma Marie was a spry, lively woman. She couldn't hear too well, although you wouldn't know it if you asked her. She said her hearing was just fine. It was everyone else around her that just wasn't speaking loud enough. <laughs> Grandma Marie took care of my grandpa, who we called Papa. And Papa had cancer. Grandma Marie took care of his everyday needs. She provided health care. She maintained the home. And she made sure the bills were paid. She eventually outlived Papa and lived her later years to the fullest. My grandma, June, was an equally amazing woman. She raised my dad and my uncle as a single mother, a rare role model for the time. The woman smoked like a chimney. But it wasn't lung cancer that she was diagnosed with. It was dementia. Dementia eventually robbed her of her personality. She lived in assisted living and then later a nursing home. Not the aging experience she probably envisioned herself having. I think this is what scares many of us when we talk about aging. There's so much uncertainty. We all want to age healthily and live independently. Some of us will, and some of us won't. These positive and negative aspects make our aging experience, and, and technology has the potential to help. I can't help but think that if my grandparents were alive today, their uh, aging experience would be completely different. I would be able to Skype and FaceTime with them. We would track their well-being using electronic health records. Information would be available on the internet. So much would be different because of technology. But only if technology is designed with older users in mind. In 40 years, there will be 1.8 billion older adults. Do you think Silicon Valley is paying attention to this growing demographic? Well, the answer is they're probably not paying as much attention as they should. Designers not only hold the key for increasing market share, but also improving the quality of older adult lives, and in some cases, even saving lives. Now, it's a myth that older adults don't use technology. <laughs> they do use technology. They use technology every day. In today's society, many forms of technology are not optional. For example, we have to use a kiosk at the airport when we check in. We have to use an automated telephone menu system when we call the pharmacy to refill our prescriptions. Or we have to use an ATM when we withdraw money. These technologies are designed for all of us. But older adults have special capabilities and limitations that need to be taken into account when we're designing technology. A common trend for many designers is to design for efficiency. They'll take a large amount of information and cram it onto a small screen. This results in small buttons, small font size, and this is not good design for anyone, especially older adults. Oftentimes, what is good design for older adults is good design for everyone else. 
Certain design principles are particularly good for, for the older population. For example, a larger font, high contrast, a clean, simple design. How many of us in this room have ever complained about a technology that's too simple or too easy to read? So we're talking about everyday technologies. What technologies will be available when you and I are older? Well, there's a lot of work being done in robotics. As an engineering psychologist, I make sure that the human is factored into the engineering equation. And my work falls under a multidisciplinary field called human-robot interaction, or HRI. I work with teams of computer scientists, engineers, social workers, and, and uh, other psychologists, and we study how older adults will interact with robots. When I first got into the field, we asked, what should robots do for older adults? Notice I said, what should robots do, not what can robots do. We wanted to go to the end user and ask them. We conducted focus groups and interviews with older adults and talked to them about a robot called the PR2, or Personal Robot 2. Now, the PR2 is a special robot. It's a mobile manipulator, meaning that it can move around the room and it can manipulate objects using its arms and its grippers. Now, you might look at this picture and say, Janae, this robot is huge. <laughs> and you're right, the older adults thought so too. It is a 400-pound gorilla of a robot. But what inspired me was that the older adults could see past the robot's size, and they could imagine the robot performing a variety of household tasks. For example, they could envision this robot cleaning their home, lifting heavy furniture, or finding and delivering objects. Importantly, the older adults were also selective in certain tasks that they did not want assistance with. For example, delivering a medication bottle, as you see in this video, was a perfectly acceptable task. However, the older adults did not want the robot to be involved in any sort of decision-making related to medication. Now, this is important because designers need to also consider what a robot should not do. Now, robots in the future will certainly perform household tasks. They can also help promote communication between people. There's a particular class of robots called telepresence. Telepresence has two-way audio, two-way video, and a mobile base so it can move around the room. You can kind of think of it as Skype on wheels. Now, telepresence has the ability to connect people and just imagine the possibilities. Imagine grandma is located here in Atlanta, Georgia. Her family, located anywhere in the world, could log in and say, hey, grandma, come on, let's go for a walk, or let's go to the mall together. Or grandpa could be at home, and maybe he's bedridden. He could log into the system and remotely attend a museum. Or imagine grandpa is located in a rural town, and he's unable to visit a medical specialist. The doctor could log in and visit grandpa remotely. The possibilities of telehealth are endless. My grandma June lived three states away when she was diagnosed with dementia. If we had this robot, we could have diagnosed her quicker, we could have assessed her living arrangements, and stayed in better contact with family, friends, and medical professionals. We are researching all of these possibilities. My students, colleagues, and I were placing these robots in retirement facilities. We're investigating the use of these robots by older adults with disability. And we're even evaluating the user interface to ensure that it's user-friendly. Now, we recognize that this do does not replace the importance of seeing others in person. However, it can be the next best thing, above and beyond a traditional telephone or video conferencing. So my takeaway is to know thy user and consider the aging experience in technology design. Robots are coming, 
And because of work in human-robot interaction, you will have robots that are useful in your retirement. And because of these robots, perhaps aging will be an entirely new and exciting experience. Thank you very much.